Hello, everybody. I'm Bob Isaacson. I'm the president and co-founder of Dharma Voices for Animals. And we have an exciting program for you this morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, and our program is about Thomas Jackson. He is here. He's the creator of a just a wonderful documentary uh, called A Prayer for Compassion. And so we're going to show you just a clip or two from the film. I uh, hope that you've had a chance to watch uh, his film. Uh, I, I have several times, and it's, it's, I mean, it's just a great film. And share it with people. Uh, and right now, you need a, a special link to get it, but it's also showing on Amazon Prime. And maybe Thomas can mention how else you can, uh, you can see the film. Uh, so we have a good group here. I'm going to ease into this by telling you a little bit about uh, our organization. We're sponsoring this, of course. You've come to the webinar of Dharma Voices for Animals. We call ourselves DVA. And I, I'm actually here in uh, Southern California, San Diego, California. Thomas is sitting outside there in uh, Tallahassee, uh, outside Tallahassee or inside Tallahassee, Florida, Northern Florida, uh, where Florida State is. You'll hear a little bit about that. It's where he went to school. And so I don't know how many of you are familiar with DVA. I know a lot of you are, but we have some new people coming on, which is really exciting. Uh, so let me just tell you a, a little bit about uh, Dharma Voices for Animals. A little over 10 years ago, uh, Patty, Kim, David, and I, all of us were uh, Californians, we uh, founded Dharma Voices for Animals. And we did it because we, uh, we were all Buddhists, practicing Buddhists, going to retreats. And the Buddha has a really powerful message about kindness to animals, compassion for animals, not eating animals. But so many Buddhists uh, in the United States, which is where we were seeing people meditating at centers, retreat centers, uh, they, weren't, um, they weren't vegetarian, let alone vegan. And so nobody wanted to talk about this. So we figured the only way we could get people talking about it was to create an organization. So we're a nonprofit, 501c3, and we rely on donations from everyone. So if you're uh, inclined to, to help us out so that we can get the word out, and I'll tell you more about what we're doing, you know, please go to our website and, um, and, and help us out. We appreciate that. So I mentioned we started, we thought we'd just be a California organization. And all four of us were living out here in California where it's, uh, it's about five after nine. And I, so people, well, for Thomas, it's uh, just the afternoon hour. If you're on Eastern, in the Eastern time zone, same thing. We have some folks from, from Asia. We do a lot of work in Asia. It's 11.05 uh, at night in Thailand and Vietnam. And it's uh, 9.35 at night in uh, Sri Lanka where we have uh, three big projects going. So we are, we, we really have two functions, DVA. Uh, so we are the only international animal rights, animal advocacy organization in the entire world. We're the only one. And we do our work here in the US and we also do our work in Asia. As we got into this, we realized we couldn't stay in California because we're missing almost 99% of the Buddhists in the world. They live in Asia, but of course our roots are here in, uh, in California and in the US. So we educate people on what the Buddha's message was. We educate them on the value of plant-based food. Also vegetarian is the first step to that. So if you're vegetarian, that's, that's great also. If you're aspiring, if you're none of the above and you're just listening to this and trying to figure out what you wanna do, that's fine too. Everyone has their own process. So this is, you know, DVAs for you, no matter what your diet is, whatever your choices are, but we're there to advocate for animals. We're the only voice, as I said, the only consistent voice uh, internationally uh, for animals. And then we also, uh, so we're educational, we're at, and we are ad, an advocacy group as well. We have big project in Sri Lanka, small island nation off the coast of uh, India. We have a big project in Vietnam big project in Thailand. That, um, uh, those three countries uh, make up uh, a number of 140 million, 140 million Buddhists in those three countries alone. So we're getting the word out. We go to the centers and we go to the temples and we go to the monasteries and we find ways to, um, to engage people, engage the top monk, the top nun in the, in the uh, 
at the temple, start talking about this. The more people talk about how we harm animals by eating them, obviously, the more, the less we'll be harming animals. So that's a brief introduction to, uh, to DVA, and I'll be back on later. So now you didn't come to hear me talk the whole time. I'm sure you came here to listen to, uh, to Thomas. And we're, Thomas and I are going to talk. And so it's really, it's great to see you. I mean, it's been, it's been like three or four years that we uh, they filmed. It, it would have 2016. 2016, wow. Believe it or not. You, I remember you came, you came in, so you know. I mean, I was expecting some video equipment, but you you had you had it all. And you came one trip in, in the living room. You put down one camera, and then the lights and everything like that. And it was it was great. It was great to meet you, and it was even greater to, to see the result of uh, of what we did. So there's a clip in there from from me, and then also from Lisa Levinson, one of one of our uh, allies with. Uh, um, uh, um, IDA in defense of the animals, and also the vegan coalition, uh, and uh, so many other people that uh, that we've worked with. Will Tuttle, who's on our uh, um, our advisory council, etc. So Thomas uh, studied film. He actually has a master's degree from Florida State University. That's in Tallahassee, where, where Thomas is now. Um, and I mean, it sounds like we we're just talking a few minutes before we started. Sounds like an amazing program. Uh, and he got his, so I mentioned he got his uh, master's degree, and he also was the founder of the um, Compassion Project. And this is, uh, f and this project makes films, and this was the first, right? Prayer for Compassion was the first documentary. Mm -hmm. So, hey, Thomas, welcome to, uh, to our speaker series. Hey, Bob, I'm just honored and uh, just tickled to be here, man. It's great to see you. That's I great. really... I really enjoyed meeting you and to talking to you that day that we, I interviewed you. That was awesome. Yeah, it was really, it was really awesome. It was great. So great to, we, you know, we've been emailing every now and then back and forth. It was the first time we had a chance to talk. So why don't, we, why don't we start out? Tell us about, share with us whatever you'd like about, your, about yourself, about your filmmaking, education, and career. Uh, and then also, if you could in there answer the question, why you decided or how you decided to create uh, a prayer for compassion. Okay, I'll give that a shot. Let's see. Uh, I could talk about, you know, that for hours, but I'll try to condense it down. <laughs> uh, well, I was born, I was born a long way from a vegan. I was born in South Georgia and uh, I uh, grew up Baptist. And then, um, you know, and then I went to college and uh, went to film school and uh, well, actually, I'll go back when I was a kid, I was actually Christian Young Man of the Year, you know, and a couple of little notes to mention is that um, I think the things that kind of pulled me out of the fundamentalism, uh, the little uh, gurus along the way were uh, learning a little bit about meditation, like discovering Bruce Lee and like taking martial arts is the first kind of introduction to some kind of meditation at that younger age. And then I read something he wrote about he studied many traditions and he's talking about martial arts, but he kept what worked for him and left the rest. And that became kind of like uh, subconsciously adopted as a young child. And that allowed me to explore other traditions. And, and so after film school, where, uh, which by the way, FSU has an amazing film school to this day. Back in the day, we were still shooting on film. We were shooting on 16 millimeter. And, um, and my thesis film from FSU won the Student Academy Award and it, ah, uh, yeah, you know, and it took me. You might have mentioned it. You might have mentioned it, but uh, it got a little attention. You know, I got to go to Cannes and Turkey with it, and you know, and uh, it was kind of my first intro into like the biz or whatever. And uh, so I spent a little time in Burbank, but I tell you what happened around the same time is I started having the spiritual calling, a spiritual journey where I was discovering more. When I was in Burbank is when I really started meditating. It's when I started finding books on different subjects and Buddhism was one of the subjects, you know, I, it was just a time of uh, spiritual inquiry. And at that same time, I was getting this heat for the film, but I really didn't know what I wanted to say. You know, like I felt like I had so much to learn. What do I have to say, you know? So uh, I never could commit to anything really film wise. And I just became the spiritual quest. And so I ended up moving to New York at some point and I found a unity church where I was uh, 
taking workshops and I became the volunteer coordinator. I was uh, starting to meditate every day. It became a practice. And it was when I started meditating every day that I started noticing the energy in my food. And I started having thoughts like, um, cause as a kid growing up in the South, I'd seen animals killed for food. I seen my grandma wring the necks of her chickens. I'd seen my dad clean fish a lot. They call it cleaning, but you know, scaling. And I mean, it was very graphic as a child. I can remember seeing that and just a, almost having to put a part of me asleep, feeling like when I grow up, I'm gonna have to be doing this. Like this is something you have to tough it up and do. And it really kind of shocking. I think a part of me went to sleep at that time. And so when I started meditating every day, it hit me when I go to eat, I'm like, wait, this was a being and it died. And, you know, I never heard of veganism, but I'd heard of vegetarianism. And I thought, well, I don't have to eat this thing. You know, I don't have to eat this being. And I just kind of woke up and realized, hey, you know, it's not, it's, I'm more in alignment with being a vegetarian. So I became a vegetarian, um, like right away. I didn't, this is before YouTube, it was 2005. So I didn't really know any vegetarians or vegans at the time. But um, I went to a deli like a week or so later and I was so proud of being a vegetarian. I ordered something and I said, make, make sure it's vegetarian. <laughs> you know, the guy, you know, I think the guy by the counter, I don't think he was vegan or vegetarian. He was like, vegan or vegetarian? And I'm like, vegan? <laughs> what in the world is vegan? It, it sounded like something from Star Trek, you know, like uh, Planet Vega or something. I don't know. And there was a little thought that went off in my head. I'm like, I don't know why. First of all, I'm like, what is vegan? Like, what is vegan? And he said, it means no animal products. And at the time, I didn't really understand the importance of any of that. I just knew that part of me said, if people are doing this, there must be something behind it, you know? And I just became a vegan. Like, I didn't, it just became one. <laughs> and it was only later when I was like looking for places in New York to get food. They, there was this, uh, used to be a website called Super Vegan. Uh, and it had uh, all the listings of vegan friendly restaurants around the city. And uh, this is before there was so many vegan restaurants. But um, so I go on there and they had a little blog and I would start to see some of this. But somehow, you know, and at the time I go back to Un uh, Unity, a lot of what they were teaching about kindness and compassion and, and just uh, all of these interconnectedness of everything, like that's why I became vegan. <laughs> so I go to church and then I would go afterwards to brunch and I'd see these people eating meat and, and just things I knew was like not living what they were teaching, you know, and, but I was new to unity, new to veganism. And I was like, who am I to tell anybody anything? So I basically adopted the philosophy of live and let live and be a good example. And that, and I did that, you know, and that worked uh, because I didn't know any vegans. I, it allowed me to be friends with people still and not feel, you know, I didn't know how to manage. I didn't have anybody to, to discuss um, the feelings you have when you suddenly realize what you're, what you were indoctrinated into and you see it for what it is and you see the people around you still complicit in it. And for their own soft hearts, you don't want to, because you know, they're all sweet and loving. So you don't want to, uh, to see that. So there was a lot of complication to that, but I just learned to be with it, you know? And then I would say it was about 2000, when my daughter was born, Melody was born in 2012. And um, I was vegan about seven years at that time. And um, that got me really on learning about nutrition, you know, learning how to make sure how to feed some. So I learned a lot about nutrition. And then like a year later, or a year and a half later, Cowspiracy, they had a screening at our local Talvege. And I saw that movie, man. And that really, I had somehow I'd missed the whole memo about the environment and animal agriculture. I mean, I was already vegan, but I had no idea that it was devastating so much. And so with that in mind, I realized, you know, I could no longer just be live and let live. I had to somehow be live and wake up. And so when I saw that movie and uh, felt very troubled and alarmed about my daughter's future, I started praying and meditating about it. And I got the idea to make the film. And basically it came out of that feeling I had when I was at Unity, seeing the people uh, participating in this, wondering how, I knew them as compassionate, loving, spiritual beings. And like, it didn't seem in alignment. And at this point I knew the environmental impact and the he uh, health impact, mm -hmm. you know? So I was totally aware that this was totally not something that would be in alignment with any like positive spiritual path. Like anybody, if you looked at this um, without the glasses of indoctrination, 
you would see that this is barbaric, it's cruel to the animals, it's cruel to human health. The, we get all the signals in the world from the way it affects the health that this is not good for our karma. I mean, it's very clear. And then um, the environmental impact. So it was those kind of questions that led me to want to go to, and also want me to go and kind of to aware, make people aware of this. Like if I, th I just thought in my heart, like I didn't know about cows not just being milk machines. I was vegan many years before I discovered they had to be impregnated and their baby taken. I had no idea about this stuff. So my heart thought if I could just if, ask somebody about that, you'll see in the film, I asked a couple of people about that. My thought was once if I had known this, this would have been the game changer for me back in the day, I would think. So I just feel like this is something people would want to know if they're trying to live a, a loving and spiritual and religious and be true to their um, values and ethics. So that's where the film originated was from that desire. And then, um, as you see, I live in the woods. I still live in the woods. I live in a little camper and, uh, and um, dedicate all my time to like this film and the new film coming and being a good father, you know, and a steward of the land, like I just trying to organize priorities in a way that, uh, and so I don't, I haven't ever pursued money. So it's amazing when you see the film, that's not the film I started out making because obviously I couldn't imagine being able to travel to Morocco and India, although I've gone back to India and all these other places since then, like, I didn't know how that would be possible, but you know, I think once you attach yourself to a purpose and say yes, and just, even if you have doubts, just step out. Like, it seems to me, I had doubts every step of the way and it continued to just show up for it. And it, and uh, the result is the film and, uh, and the wonderful experience of taking the film out and sharing it with other people has been just very rewarding and worth all the four years of like hard work and wondering if I was doing something that would just never see the light of day kind of thing. Yeah. Hey, great. I actually <laughs> found out a lot about you and about the film. You, you, some of this I knew. I knew you told me about it. But this, this, it's fascinating. It's, it's great. A lot of faith there. Just uh, trust and confidence, if you will. Just going out there and doing it because you felt moved. So that, it's beautiful. So, you know, I, want, I wanted to play, if, if Charles is ready to do this, a clip of uh, Victoria Moran. I uh, just got off one of her... Um, uh, one of her interviews uh, for the Compassion Consortium last week. And she's an amazing uh, advocate because she tells a story about watching a slaughter just before a slaughter in a slaughterhouse, which you have in the film. And what if I'm going to stop for a minute and see if Charles could possibly play this for us. I meet a lot of people who say, well, I only eat humane meat. I only eat meat from small family farms. Well, these cows came from a small family farm. The farmer drove them in himself. You could tell that these cows knew people and trusted them. So the first couple just walked up the chute and on to death, but the third one was not having any of it. She saw her friends go first. She heard the screams and she smelled the smells that I'd been smelling all day. She was not about to walk up that ramp. So she just planted herself and stood there. And the man up at the top of the ramp, about time to go home, he was ready to go see his kids. He whistled to her. He whistled to her the way he'd whistled to his dog when he went home in 20 minutes. And this cow seemed to trust him. She kind of turned her head and looked at him, and it was as if she was deciding whether or not to override all her instincts, what she was hearing, what she was smelling, and instead do something that we pride ourselves as humans in being able to do, trust another person. So with this trust misplaced as it turned out, she walked to the man who had whistled to her. He got her with the captive bolt pistol. She was hoisted up, her throat was slit, her beautiful skin was sliced off her and into a pile to go for shoes and boots and belts and handbags. And all of a sudden, she was no longer a being. She was in the process of becoming beef. Now, I knew that in a few days, her parts and pieces would wind up at a supermarket in St. Louis. 
They would be on a styrofoam tray and cellophane wrapping, and they would be purchased by good people. They'd be purchased by people who love their children and give to charity and go to church. Well, they didn't know her. I did for just a few minutes at the very end of her life. But because I knew her, it's my obligation to share her story. Wow. Um, so that, uh, that uh, is so touching, just touches my heart. And uh, so it's powerful, powerful scene. So uh, Thomas, could you talk about, about that scene and anything, any other scenes that were particularly um, uh, memorable and, and important? Listen, I mean, that scene for sure, if anybody watches the film and they tell me they cried, I'm like, it's the cow story, right? Everyone and everybody. Uh, I shot that three different times, three different times I had her, had her tell me that story. And every time by the end, I'm bawling. Like you can, um, I have to be so quiet to make sure I'm not heard. And then when I edited it, oh my God, like it just never, like even now, like I got to a trick cause there's a, there's a part that gets me. It's, it's the part that really gets me is when um, she talks about good people. It's bought by good people, people who love their children, people who give to charity, people who go to church. Like that rips my heart out when I hear that because I realize, one, I used to be that person and two, I'm watching so many people I love, uh, knowing how kind and compassionate, and they give you the shirt off their back, people they are participating in that. And that really brings it home to me. And uh, so, yeah. And the other thing I'll say is at one point, I had really wanted to get parts of that story animated. Uh, and now that I watch it again, I'm, I'm glad it didn't work out. Like I really feel the story strong enough and just re the reminder of a few images of what she's talking about is enough to make the story work. And um, so, yeah, uh, another thing as far as related to my caring and loving people that the film stood out for me that taught me was um, the idea of, I met so many people that were sick at one point in their life that had um, went and had medications, having surgeries and all these things and they changed their lifestyle. You know, you can see I interviewed doctors who talked about doing this with many people, you know. Um, and so watching how a vegan lifestyle and taking the violence out of your diet can really affect your health while at the same time watching these compassionate people I'm talking about that I love, like in my family and place, people like my cousin who was in the hospital twice while I was making the film, you know, and another cousin had a heart attack while I was taking the film out, you know, and it's just, you know, people of my age with this going through these cancers and all these in my family. And, you know, after seeing what I've seen and also in my own life, I'm a veteran. So I go to get my blood work done every year. And I always get this amazing blood work. But if you look at the people in both sides of my family, like they're all sick. At my age, a man my age and that family should be on some kind of medication. My dad was on medication until the day he died from when he was about my age, you know? So, um, yeah, so witnessing that has affected me just overall, just witnessing the health benefits and the spiritual benefits and the softening of the heart. So uh, that's not a particular scene, but just overall the message and the people I interviewed about that. Um, another one for me was um, when I, Silish, he talked about, um, he asked people whether they would hurt, ever unnecessarily hurt an innocent animal. He'll ask the group, I've done it many times now too. <laughs> And you'll always see nobody raises their hand. Nobody wants to unnecessarily hurt an innocent animal. They don't want to do that. You know, he said that in the film. And that, but then what you don't see in the film is that when he asks people that and they say nobody raises their hands, he says, congratulations, you're vegan. <laughs> That's all a vegan is, is somebody who doesn't want to unnecessarily hurt an, an innocent animal. And uh, his second part to that is like in the film, he talked about the Pope, about how, you know, when what we say and what we do are out of alignment, we suffer. He was talking about the Pope eat, you know, saying the animals shouldn't suffer unnecessarily and then having the, you know, the uh, some kind of meats and lobster dinner. I don't even remember veal and lobster, I think even worse. So, um, you know, uh, 
at the time I didn't really get that part, but that whole thing I'm saying is like watching people suffer for not living their true compassionate natures uh, has become very real for me. Um, you know, it, I'm losing people right and left to it. And so that breaks my heart. But uh, so those two things he taught me really had, or those two things he said and that I've seen him do has really affected me in the way I talk to people and my activism and just in life, realizing that everybody I talk to is already a vegan. And if for some reason they're not living it, they're out of alignment with that true compassionate nature. And then somewhere in their life, there's some suffering going on. There's some karma coming around because the thing I learned about karma too, it doesn't matter if you're looking at it, karma's going to keep coming at you. You know, you keep doing the thing. I'm not looking at you, but it keeps hitting you until you get the message in some way. So, uh, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks. And, and karma for the folks that identify as Buddhists or practice the Dharma, it's a really important uh, teaching. I'm really happy you mentioned it. Yeah. It's not, of course, limited to the Buddhist teaching. It was actually all the re uh, religions at the time of the Buddha 2,600 years yeah. ago yeah. had at the center a karma. It's a law. This is a, It's cause and effect. You put something out there, something will come back. Yes. The golden rule. The golden rule. It, it's in so many of the traditions. It's, uh, it's a thing they have in common. Compassion for people, animals, and your health is something they all seem to have in common, too. You know? Yeah, beautiful. Thanks a lot for yeah. sharing that. I, you know, it tears in my eyes also. It's really hard to see that. I've seen it now, I think, four yeah. times. Scene and wow, just so so moving. As are so many of the cuts and the scenes in, in your film. So for those who are, are are with us right now, and many of you I'm sure have seen the film, but some of you haven't. So Thomas, how long is it possible to keep that link up there? At least a few days or something? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn that link. It, is it'll work forever? Like you at some point when I'm in front of my computer, I'm gonna take that password off. So that'll be just a link anybody who wants to see it can see it. I'm gonna, yeah. and you know, you can share it with anybody you want. I don't really care. <laughs> like I, 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 I honestly, I would put it on YouTube, but here's the thing about YouTube. They put ads on stuff until you get a thousand subscribers, which I've never posted my YouTube because I've never been, a, there's other reasons, I, uh, technical reasons I like Vimeo better. Uh -huh. But um, so I never really tried to build a client, uh, a base, but unless you have a thousand, they did this thing last year where they put ads on, you can't say no ads. You can't say I want this kind of ad. So, you know, somebody could be watching a film and an ad for, you know, Butterball or something could come up, you know, and I'm just like, I don't want to risk that. I'd rather have this link going around. Anybody wants it and maybe we'll advertise it. And then the next thing is try to build enough followers that I can put it on YouTube and not have uh, ads. Cause honestly, I would not want any ads interrupting a film. Yeah, I hear, and I hear you. It's really generous for you to do that. Yeah. So, so, uh, so everyone on the call now, you're the first to uh, to hear this. So, th yeah. thanks a lot for doing that. It's really yeah. generous, uh, Thomas. Yeah. The, could you talk a bit about just change gears a little bit? Talk a little bit, if you could, about compassion, uh, compassionate living challenge, uh, and the four pillars of well being. Yeah, you know, in the film itself, it, the film ends with me challenging each of us to try to find more ways to be, bring compassion into our lives. That's, I'm kind of challenged us at the end of the film. Um, and so the Compassionate Living Challenge is kind of going along with that. I created a, uh, something on our website that gives you a little more detail and some suggestions. It has a page full of links, you know, supporting people who may have just starting veganism, whatever. And also the compassionate living challenges uh, for vegans as well, because we can all bring more compassion into our lives. A lot of it has to do with self-compassion and self-care. Mm -hmm. So many vegans feel like, you know, they don't feel like they should take the time to do something to rejuvenate themselves or to get enough rest. They have to fight, 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 because these animals are suffering. But, you know, I interviewed in the new film, I interviewed Dr. Melanie Joy, and she says the animals don't need a, a a movement of zombies, you know, walking zombies because they're trauma survivors is what basically is what she's saying. You got, we got to take care of ourselves and learn to be present and be more effective. You know, I've been doing some street activism with some of the activists, some of my activist friends when we travel, we don't do a lot around Tallahassee, but in Tampa and all, they do a lot. So we've been doing some of that and watching activists interact, you know, there's just uh, people learning to love and have compassion for each other.
but I, I now I feel like I'm going off the question. What was? That? Oh yeah, yeah. No, just to tell us about the Compassionate Living Challenge. So oh yeah, just yeah. Go so to the website. Tell, tell the link. To yeah, us. you can go to the website. I, I started thinking about the movie right then because I've I've uh -huh. been editing this and this is one of the themes of the movie. But um, yeah. So the Compassionate Living Challenge itself. Um, one of the things is while I was making the film, I kind of knew I was going to challenge us to take better care of ourselves and. Um, so halfway through, I realized, dude, I better start stepping it up a little bit. You know, I wasn't really boosting my health and doing all the things. And what I kind of discovered, I stumbled upon something that I call my personal uh, four pillars of well-being. I kind of found out if I can get good nutrients, if I get up in the morning and have my green smoothies and eat good, healthy, organic, vegan food, and that if I exercise, move the body around, and if I uh, meditate, and then if I sleep well, the sleep was the last thing I added, but if you, if I could do those four things, it was hard to feel anxious or to get worried or, you know, I could feel more tapped into my energy and creativity. Like whenever I'm really including those four things on a regular basis, you know, I'm really, and, it, and I'll be the first to tell you, it's hard to do that every single day. Some days it's really hard to meet all of those things, but um, the more we can do that and do things that feed our soul, the more effective we're going to be. So the compassionate living challenge is really trying to help us become better activists by uh, taking better care of ourselves yeah. and, and challenging people who aren't vegan to at least to try veganism along with meditation and you know sleep and exercise and all of these things in any one of those things could make your life feel better but I feel like if you can add those four things and, and really to let yourself know you deserve those you have needs everybody has needs and if you can fulfill those through find ways that fulfill your needs you can uh, be more effective for the animals that's some of what that's about. That's great. I'm really happy you talked about this and also have uh, are, are devoted to getting the message out on this. Uh, so I try to live by that also. It's, it's really important. I got a, uh, um, a uh, um, wetlands uh, reserve behind my house, just like mm. right out there in the backyard. And it's there's six miles of uh, hiking trails. I'm out there almost every day going up the hills and stuff and, and all the rest, meditation. Yeah, and, and that's, that's really important. I'm also uh, a lay Buddhist teacher, been trained to do this. I've been practicing 25 years. It's really, I completely agree with what, what you said. It all, and then rest, getting sleep, and, and then and then good food. And so vegan diet, you know, you know if you get, I, I didn't start out as, as vegan. My first move many, many years ago was to become vegetarian. So I didn't really know, understand everything as you were saying about yourself before about cows and chickens and, and all, but this, so this is what I did, but it was a lot easier once I made that commitment to be vegetarian, to make, to make the uh, transition to, to being vegan. So, which I did think. 17 years ago or so. So wherever you are, you know, sometimes it can be really imposing to, to go from eating everything, which is how I was raised also, to becoming vegan when you should really be careful what you're eating. There's so many things you can eat. It's so many choices and it's really much easier than we think, but it's still, it, 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 it's a challenge to make that move. So just if you can make a move to vegetarian or vegetarian three times a week or vegan a couple times a week or one day a week, you make a commitment to take animals and animal products out of your diet that's really effective way. So don't do nothing because you can't do everything, I guess is what I would, would you, would you agree, agree with that? Yeah, I'd say start. And, and honestly, if you can give yourself three weeks at some point just to clean it out, that's when you're gonna feel the biggest difference. One of the doctors I interviewed in India said it took like two to three weeks for the any dairy to kind of even leave your system. So the inflammation from dairy can last, you know, so if you're, I think it's great in whatever you do, but you may not get the same results. Like you may still have, if you have an inflammation problem, you still may, if you're feeding that inflammation like um, every other meal or something, you're not gonna have as much inflammation, but you'll still have inflammation. But if this is just, if you feel great already and you're doing this for uh, trying to do a more spiritual reason, then then yeah, any steps you can take is wonderful. Yeah. I, that's just for the health thing. I, you know, I don't want somebody to try it for a couple of days and say, oh, it didn't make me feel better. Well, you got to give it three weeks to really clear your system in order to feel what you hear about those kind of results. If you want to feel it, you got to give it that time. But if you just want to feel better consciously about creating less environmental, less harm um, uh, to the animals and less harm to your health, then any elimination is great. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, we completely agree. And, and to start, just take the first step. If you yeah. climb a mountain, you know, think you can, you can get up there. Well, the first, you still have to take the first step and then you see how it is and maybe the second step. So that's yeah. great. So I know a lot of people are intimidated by, by the, oh, I have to change everything I'm doing. Well, just, just start somewhere, yeah. find some place to get. Yeah, great. this is great. Uh, so also, I want to ask you about uh, Dr. Silas Rao, uh, who's very mm -hmm. prominent. He's in your film uh, several, several times. I know you've worked with him. You're working with him with, you know, uh, with you know, the project that you were telling me about a little bit earlier. We could talk about that. Uh, so I want to ask you, he's uh, they also he's uh, he was a I think it was an executive producer of um, of Cowspiracy, the film that you mentioned uh, that, that changed yeah. uh, things for you and also what the health. So Keegan Kuhn, I just want to say uh, plug Keegan back in. Was it 2013, maybe 2012, we started the film. We found Keegan. Uh, he was um, he, had, he had already done Cowspiracy, but he hadn't yet hooked up with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, who really helped uh, co-produce co and then uh, did something. I think he co-produced Cowspiracy or, or um, uh, What the Health, and then he was uh, had another huge role in the other film. So it was before that. Keegan wasn't all that well-known, but he was a wonderful filmmaker. And we found him through a mutual friend and he he he, filmed, he produced our film Animals and the Buddha, which is on YouTube. And I'm sure there are some like terrible advertisements uh, there. But we've been up there since 2014 when we had the grand opening. So Silas Rao worked on and helped out and was the executive producer of those two films, uh, Cowspiracy and What the Health. And um, what so what, tell tell me a little about what it's like working with him. Uh, and also, if you want a little bit about his role in, in your film. Okay, um, <clears throat> that and I'll just want to say that uh, I got to meet Keegan in uh, Sedona Veg Fest, I think in 2018 or ni 19, uh, early in the year, right before we released. Uh -huh. And uh, he is so sweet and such amazing. I'm a big fan of his work, period. Like what he's working on now, he's got two different films. You know, like I'm a big fan of what he's doing and uh, him as a person. So, and I saw what he did with you guys. So I think you couldn't have got a better filmmaker at all. Um, and then, but with Silish, like, yeah, it's amazing too, because, you know, I told you Cowspiracy inspired the film. Well, Silish kind of found us. He was the first person to find us in the sense I had interviewed Victoria and Will, and I put together two or three little trailers and put them out there. And um, Sharon Foster at the uh, Sedona or at the Illuminate film festival in Sedona she had seen the trailers and she wrote to me and she said hey we want you to screen your film at this film festival and I'm like what film <laughs> you know like I've interviewed two people so I told her I'll check back in with you later you know and, uh, but she told Silas about us and he uh, found us and he's the first person to give us any uh, funding to help us get the get off and rolling he's the one that funded us getting out to LA and stuff and then he shows up like in Morocco he invited me to Morocco and then um, we had our premiere at the first, v or our, it wasn't our premiere opening, it was our preview. We had our first preview at the um, Vegan World 2026. Now what that is, is that is a, uh, something Silas just started that's related to a promise he made his granddaughter. But um, he, um, Silas's history is that when he was younger, he was one of the engineers that helped create the internet. And the way they did that is they brought groups of the engineers volunteered their time and they came in and they worked on, they, they figured out all the problems of connectivity and they broke off into subgroups and each of them kind of discovered the best practices of each of these issues. Uh, some of them, they just had to say, yeah, this works, this doesn't, some they had to create from scratch. So, um, but that's how they did the internet. So when he came to do Vegan, 20, Vegan World 2026, this is way he's formulated uh, the way that's working. Our first meeting in 2018, in October in uh, Mesa, Arizona, uh, he laid it all out and we broke into groups and started identifying these issues and it's never stopped. Like a year later, we had another in person and every three months there's a uh, online convergences. And actually right now, as we speak, uh, they're having a vegan world 2026 online convergence. If you're interested and it's all weekend, We'll be screening films. They're gonna uh, be screening that new film. Is it Gunda or something like that? I haven't seen it yet. Um, 
they're going to screen that. They're going to screen Peaceful Kingdom this time. There's a couple other things they're screening. There's three rooms always going that you can come in and contribute to, listen to. Um, so if you have any desire to help bring about a vegan world by 2026 and want to be part of that process, you can go to climatehealers.org um, and look for the can conversion. You say, can you say that again, Thomas? The uh, Cli climatehealers.org. Climatehealers.org. Yeah, and if you, .org. Yeah. Yeah. And if yeah. you can get to their Facebook page, you'll see, I mean, they're going to be uh, streaming all the rooms. So you'll be able to see what you missed on their Facebook page, or you'll be able to get links to join in, or you can just watch it on the Facebook page if you don't, and comment in the link. Somebody's always monitoring it. So it's growing. It's been growing. It's a, uh, um, so that's some of the work that's the main work he's doing but he's doing it every single day there's always something if you go to there you'll see they're always posting videos and stuff every single day working on issues to bring about a vegan world and um so in that way you know he's been a mentor to me um he also i think he's a living example of homo ahimsa uh, homo ahimsa i don't know if you've heard that term but jo judy carmen uh wrote a book recently about homo ahimsa, but she coined the term in another book. But um, it's basically, you know, we call ourselves the wise ones or whatever, and like, we're not living very wisely. So, you know, it's like um, metamorphosizing ourselves from the wise ones to the caring and uh, to the nonviolent ones, to the affirmative of life. So he, he's somebody who, I, a matter of fact, the Interfaith Vegan Coalition awarded him and his granddaughter the first, uh, Homo Ahimsa Award earlier this year. Uh -huh. and you mentioned Judy Carmen, and she's the head of uh, In Defense of Animals, I IDA. Yeah. So no, she, no, no, she's not the head of IDA, but she's her and Lisa Levinson and myself are the formed the Interfaith Vegan Coalition. Ah, okay. And her and Lisa Levinson do the uh, vegan spirituality. Her and Lisa are powerhouses in themselves and the work right, that they right. do on so many levels. Um, it's amazing, you know. Great. And, and when we finish, you're going to check out the uh, the conference is going yeah, on. I'm going to go back to the conference. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to let's just pause for a moment, see about questions. I'm look at, looking, Charles, any questions in particular that we uh, should ask? I'm checking here. Anyone's questions? Uh, so let, let's continue. Uh, and then we'll take the questions at the end, which was the original uh, the original plan. So uh, Nita Shanti, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Nita Shanti? Nita yeah, Nita, Shanti? Nita, yeah. Nita Shanti. Nita Shanti. Nita Shanti, yeah. Nita Shanti is um, a former Buddhist monk and was really um, drawn to uh, the, the portion of your film where he's talking and he talks about uh, compassion or karuna. So as you already said now, and it's the theme of your, of your film, compassion is central to all major world religions. Uh, and as a practicing Buddhist myself, uh, it's central to, to, to our practice. It's called karuna. It's the, that's the Pali uh, word, uh, the word first uh, language that the uh, Buddhist teachings were translated into. And karuna, and, and the, the, this, this is so amazing. This is actually the, 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 the reason or the centerpiece of DVA, of Dharma Voices for Animals. See, we have this teaching by the Buddha, and his teaching was that if uh, if there is a sentient sentient being, sentient being means a being that can feel, or more precisely, feel pain. If there's a sentient being, however small it is, it could be a, a small chick, a chicken, a fish, uh, any sentient being. We know that all the animals that we eat are animals that can feel pain, that we owe them compassion. They're part of the circle of compassion and owe them not to harm them, to be careful, responsibility not to harm them. Yet, and this is the, uh, was our motivation to, to, uh, to start DV. I think I told you about this. Uh, Buddha, so many Buddhists around the world were not, were not following this teaching. And, it, and it's, it's true in all religions. And, and like, you know, as, as you said, and I'm just mentioning here, compassion is central. So, so he, taught, he talks about that. Can you, can you uh, say something and share with us, Thomas, um, what, you know, what his message was? I, I kind of uh, put out there what I understand the, the Buddha's message and DVA's uh, mission to be. Can you say more about, uh, about his, 
about what he added to the film, what you took from his um, uh, from his presence in your film, and also what you what you learned uh, it, 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 uh, about say about Buddhism that you didn't know. What, what, so just yeah, please. Yeah, you know, I'm going to start by saying because um, you're bringing up compassion and how it's central to most religions. Well, when I started making the film, I was going to make a film about veganism and spirituality. That's all I kind of had in mind. And then when I interviewed Victoria, who's the first person I interviewed, you'll see in the film where she mentions that all of the religions have compassion in common. So I left New York after I interviewed her and I thought, this is something to do with compassion. This is where the Compassion Project started to be born. But what sealed the deal is when I read the definition of compassion or a definition that said, you know, empathy for the suffering of another. But then there was a second part, which is, uh, to the point of being motivated to take action to alleviate that suffering. Mm -hmm. So I saw, I began to see compassion as almost like an action, you know, like uh, the first part, if you, all you have is the uh, empathy, then all you have is empathy. But if you're actually motivated to take action, then that's where compassion kicks in. If you really want to feel the power of compassion, because I believe compassion is powerful. I believe it's healthy. I believe like the more compassionate you are, the more you can live that the better you're gonna more peace you're gonna have period i don't see how it can be any other way like karma wise or any other way so compassion as the buddhist as uh nisa said the buddha said it's the noblest truth you know it's the noblest truth and uh he also talked about he's also one of the only ones that mentioned the idea of being motivated to take action he mentioned that so i, I appreciate him saying that but one of the things i really love that he said was at the beginning of the interview where he said that for so many years he worried about being more and more like the buddha i'm not enough like the buddha i should be more like the buddha and then one day it dawned on him that uh -oh. uh, so thomas we're losing you a little bit you had you had worried about that because i know your internet is not that strong yeah so just to, if you could just go back about 15 seconds we didn't we didn't hear what what you yeah just the last 15 seconds or something so, so Nitha, when he talked about not being enough like the Buddha, like I, I appreciate when he said um, that he worried that he wasn't enough like the Buddha, that he could be more like the Buddha, but that used to concern him until one day his eyes shone when he realized he could never be the Buddha, but the Buddha could never be him. And it's just that idea of that we all have our own purpose and that we all are here to be the best of us that we're here to do like that really, I love that idea. And what's interesting about that is I had a, a Jane lady friend of mine who worried when she heard that, she said, I'm afraid Buddhists will be offended by that. And so I'm gonna ask you, you're a Buddhist, were you, does that offend you in any way by him saying that, you know, he used to worry about, he realized he couldn't be the Buddha, but the Buddha couldn't be him. Like, does that, is that offensive in any way maybe? <laughs> mm. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I didn't think it was offensive because I, I mean, I, like as a Christian, if somebody had to say that about Jesus, no. I would, I would feel, no. you're right. I can never be Jesus. We could right. never be, you know, so yeah, but people are very sensitive when it comes to religion. I learned, I had to cut several things out of the film because no. it could be offensive to somebody, but this one, I, I really, in my heart thought that it wouldn't be so. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I didn't take offense in the slightest to, to, yeah. to that. So but it, oh, it, it, it's usually, it's usually another religion that's worried about me. Yeah. offending another religion it's never somebody from that religion usually coming in and saying this is offensive to my religion somebody saying i'm afraid this could be offensive to that religion it just shows you how sensitive and yeah. caring that spiritual and religious people are yeah exactly. you know, it's just that's, an example exactly it's what that's what yeah. it is to me but so uh, there's a question here from adele who asks will there be a theater screening for your film in new york city well a prayer for compassion had its premiere in New York City uh, in 2019. So the film's already out and it was uh, premiered in 2019. We sold out like a 400 seat theater and it was awesome. But um, I have to verify this, but one of the best things that happened for us is early on the Veg Fund gave us a grant. And this grant was that anybody who wanted to screen the film could organize a screening in their church or library or wherever, or theater, wherever it may be and uh, the veg fund would pay us a licensing fee and if they serve vegan food they would provide 
some compensation for some of the vegan food. So it really got us out. This is why I traveled up until the quarantine. I was traveling all over because the veg fund allowed people to screen for free mm. wherever. And, I, and if I couldn't be there, I did, you know, virtually. But uh, I think we're going to kick that back, back off. So if somebody wants to have a public screening, if you'll reach out, if you go to our website, aprayerforcompassion.com, and you leave me a message and say, I want to screen this in my library, my church, or my Buddha center, or my you know, yoga center, wherever, uh, and we want you to be part of the Q&A, just reach out to me. I'll be happy to organize that uh, or give you information on how to, do, how to apply for the grant, and I'll also be happy to give you the, the film or whatever you need and be present for you if I'm able. Yeah, great. And you, probably, you might remember this. I think it was early, it's probably early in 2019. I would believe so. DVA joined with San Diego Vegan uh, Society, and we screened actually here in Encinitas, which is about 10 minutes away. Uh, it yeah, was wonderful. No. We used a re restaurant, and we reserved the big room. We had a lot of people show up, and, and uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was wonderful. So what you're saying is you're empowering people out there that if they want to show the film, just uh, check, check, check in. How would they, um, how would they do this? Who just, they go to, just go to a prayerforcompassion.com or our Facebook page, anywhere, and leave a message at any of these places, and they come straight to me. So anything to do with the film. Um, follow our Facebook page, you know, that'll keep you updated if there's any new information coming out. You know, we're working on a new film. We have a new trailer that's out there for that. And uh, so, yeah. Great. Okay, great. So another question, uh, Thomas. So Vicki Seglin. Vicki has been, uh, she's our uh, one of our ambassadors here in the United States, DVA. Um, she says, thank you. You're very inspiring and I love your ability to live by your values and not get co-opted by the film world. I wonder how you feel and deal with despair as we continue to expose ourselves to the cruelties that so many good people are afraid to look at. Important question. One more time. What was the question? Oh, Did it? What was the what, Thomas? The very end, was it? Oh, the very end. We... Yeah. So I wonder how you feel and deal with despair as we continue mm. to expose ourselves to the cruelties. Uh, that, yeah. yeah, I don't know if that's it directly for a filmmaker who had to, you know, look at these images over and over. Um, but yeah, it's tough. You know, I mean, for me, it's on many levels. It's the level of what's happening to the animals. As I went around with the new film, I went to a couple wet markets myself and kind of witnessed things firsthand. Um, I've been doing pig vigils and different things. Um, it's really tough, you know, and at the same level, you know, I lost my dad last year to a stroke and he had a hamburger steak like an hour before his stroke, you know, and he's been on statin since he was my age. Like, you know, I really tried so hard with him at one point, you know, and told him I, that was, this is the biggest pitch and they just didn't want to do it. But, um, but seeing family members, seeing people I love get sick. I mean, that's another level. All of these is when you really wake up to the indoctrination we've been given in this um, world and we've been led to believe that, you know, it's just, this is a violent world and you have to like fight to survive in this world. And, and uh, you really have to just, that's, I think, where, the, where your Buddhist teachings or, or any kind of path you're on, this is where you come in and you, this is where you find your peace. You're not going to find it out there. You're going to, for me, going out to these vigils and doing something is a way to alleviate some of that internal suffering, knowing that I'm trying to be part of the solution. That's, feel, that's a way to alleviate it. Meditating, exercising, knowing that I'm caring for my body and myself and my health and all of these things for not just me, but to be an example of veganism, you know, like all everything in my life right now, I try to make to where any minute anybody's in front of me, I I'm going to be an ambassador to veganism. If I see they're ready and on the line on the, you know, you know, if we're in life and it gives me the end, I'm going to take it and I'm going to be present and open and vulnerable with that person and see where they're at. And uh, I'm going to give them the information I think that would be most relevant and important to them. And um, so I think learning to be a better advocate and mm. realizing you don't have, like, I don't sit around and watch this footage. Like I've seen enough of it. And in the new film, like I'm not pulling, I'm trying to avoid as much as possible other than where I've witnessed and even keep that 
to a level that people, I mean, I think people can get it without being immersed in it. And, um, but yeah, it's just tough. It's, it's different for each person, but you have to, I really think you have to realize that you, to be a better advocate, you have to take care of yourself. You have to not be a trauma survivor from watching all this. You have to do, if it takes therapy, do therapy. If it takes meditation, whatever it takes to find that peace within you is going to make because the other thing too is I do feel we're all connected and I feel the better you feel the world around you is going to feel better. You're going to, you know, I've seen it in my life. I've seen it when I'm walking around feeling good, I can feel people that need it coming around and, and I'm able to say things. I mean, the universe lines up opportunities for me to share this light when I've honed it and got it ready. And when I'm, you know, in t other times, you know, it's hard to have compassion when you're suffering in any way, like losing my dad or different things. Like there's times where, you realize this is a time to go within and deal with myself and walk away. And you, you'll always get another chance to advocate for the animals. Um, so, um, but please do advocate for them, but to realize it's not our job. We didn't break it. So we don't have to fix the whole thing. We have to try to figure out what our part in the fixing is. That's where like in the meditation, the idea for the film and other things come to me. And so in meditation, you may find ideas that's your part, part, part in fixing it. And so you do your part the best that you can, and then you go and you live a life the best that you can so that when the, you approach people, they don't see a, like Dr. Uh, Melanie Joy said, they don't see a walking trauma survivor. They see someone thriving that has the good news. Cause you know, I don't know if I can say this, but uh, we had, if we were gonna talk about this later or whatever, but you know, lately I've started calling myself a veganulist. Uh -huh you know, a veganist because I got the good news. Hallelujah, you know, good news only means, or I got the gospel, I got the gospel. Cause that's good news, gospel, it's the same thing. And my good news for you is that the more you align yourself with your true compassionate nature, the better you're gonna feel. Yeah. You know, the better you're gonna, the more connections you're gonna feel to whatever spiritual or religious past you, you're on. Like all the people I interviewed, their health got better pretty early. And then within six months to a year, they started feeling more connection. Their heart softened, as Elaine said in the film, their heart softens. So uh, I'm a veganist. I have a gift and I, not everybody's gonna take that gift, but if they don't take it, I wanna leave them with a seed. I wanna leave them with love. And I want them to walk away feeling that a vegan is love and not feeling that, you know, I, I'm holding them responsible. <laughs> for what's happening, you know. In the film that I'm working on now too, I also interviewed Dr. Um, or Claire Mann, a vegan psychologist. And she talks about how whenever we feel guilt or shame or resentment or any of these feelings, the blood rushes to the back of our head and we don't think as clearly. We feel more like fight or flight. It's the reptilian brain. And that um, there's this contagion effects that happens that if I'm talking to you and I'm the blood's in the back of my head, it's going to run, want to run the back of your head. There's times you may wonder, why did I want to hit that guy? Why did I want to get out of there? It's probably because and you had no idea your, your mind was triggered. And she talks about it as an activist, no matter how confident and collected you are, if in the back of your head, you're resenting that person, the blood's going to be in the back of your head and it's going to want to rush to the back of their head. And uh, it may push them even further away. So the good news is, is the more you meditate and you learn to be present, you can consciously keep the blood in the front of the head and you can use techniques to bring other people back, whether it be humor or just concern. I've seen where just showing concern for that person can shift that person who was once defensive to hearing what I had to say. So I think, you know, it's the more we examine ourselves and meditate and take time for ourselves, the more, at least for me, I've seen that it affects me when I approach other people. I seem to be more centered and grounded and able to see and feel them in a different way. Yeah, uh, wow, I, I love your answer. And <clears throat> it started with Vicky's question there about how to take care of ourselves with the spirit and all these other self judgment. She didn't say that, but we talked about that earlier. Yeah. Come up. And then you also, I was also going to ask you another question. You completely answered it about tips for advocates uh, and how we, you know, not just about what we say, but how we, how, how we, how we show up and how we connect with our heart to what we're talking about and the lack of judgment of, of the other person. Is, is so important. We, so, that, so we do two things at DVA. We educate and then we advocate. And it's, you can't, you really can't advocate if you're, if it's like this, nobody's going to listen. You know, they will close the door, not invited and all. So it's, it's, 
it's difficult. You got to find this this place, and you you know this well. And you might have been looking for something like this, and when you were working on your film and creating your film, it's 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 a balance between saying the harsh mm, the harsh truths, the um, mm, the truths that nobody wants to hear about, as Victoria Moran shared uh, in the bit about the, 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 her relationship with with the cow that was about to be slaughtered. On the one hand, and on the other hand, to um, to, to, to do it in a, in a way that can be heard and, and you, have to, you have to show up. So I just, it was wonderful. And we're, we're taping this, by the way, of course, it's a Zoom and we're going we're gonna to put, put it out there. Uh, probably Charles can mention it maybe, but probably Facebook and, and our YouTube channel so people can hear it again. So I, I, lo I love that answer. Uh, thanks a lot. So and I'm looking at our time. Thomas, let me give you just a, maybe a minute or two if that's enough time to say anything or to mention something that, that we haven't covered. And if you need more time, that's fine also uh, b before I, I wrap it up. So if there's anything, if there's anything else that you want to mention. Well, you know, there's on different levels. One level that I just want to mention, uh, the Interfaith Vegan Coalition that I mentioned about, you can find them, IDA, In Defense of Animals, just Google uh, IDA, Interfaith Vegan Coalition. Uh, it's a great resources. Uh, we have a lot of great resources for, uh, we have faith-based advocacy, advocacy kits that like for Buddhism and for different faiths that you can uh, find facts that'll help you support your case for veganism and whatever path you're following. Uh, we do a lot of different, um, there's different initiatives right now. We're kicking off a sermon, positive spiritual message about the animals. You can win $500 like in the next year, you, if you present this at a church, you know, come up with one and win the contest. It's a contest for that. We do a lot of stuff with the World Parliament or Parliament for the World Religion. So it's a great organization. We have a monthly meeting. Uh, anybody's interested in that, you can check that out and just uh, join us with that. Um, yeah, I mean, my main thing I like to tell people is please take care of yourself and love yourself. We need you. Whatever your purpose is, we need you to be healthy and present and open enough to show up and 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 do it. And I'll tell you that it may not always be comfortable. You may feel insecure. I have doubts every step of the way, you know, but my faith is stronger now because I've seen that if I just keep showing up, even with my doubts, that magical doors open, this happens, this happens. Like I'll be out of no money and suddenly the money will drop in because I edited so hard. Like I feel there's these unseen forces that want us. It's that, you know, the force that connects us all that wants us to succeed and be sustainable. And if you sign up to work for that good and show up and say, I'm ready to do my part, meditate and ask what your part is and just cultivate that relationship and taking good care of yourself and loving yourself and those around you, whether they're vegan or not, you gotta love them into veganism. You can't hate them into it. You can't push them further away. You know, get away from them before you do damage like I know it's hard sometimes like it's hard my family members sitting there watching them it's hard so I relate but um I do have faith that it is getting better I, people like Silas and uh, so many people I've met have I do believe we're work, we're moving toward a vegan world because we can't sustain the world we have and because people are waking up to you know I know you said it's hard but it's getting at least in the developed world it's become so easy you know, to transition with what you're used to and then tweak that to be healthier as you go. So I tell people like, don't feel bad if you got to eat some vegan Ben and Jerry's or, you know, when you're transitioning or some vegan fake burgers or whatever, you know, they're not fake, but you know what I mean? Like plant-based burgers and things like that. Like, you know, some are, are actually healthier than others, but if you need some of that to comfort you and your transition, I, I think do whatever it takes, but uh, take care of yourself, love yourself. Beautiful, man. Uh, this was uh, was wonderful. I, I want to um, I want to thank you so much for you know we 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 shouldn't let three or four years pass before we talk talk again or get together again. Great, great film for those uh, on our our call listening to Thomas Jackson and his about it talking about his film A Prayer for Compassion. Uh, see it if you haven't seen it see it again share the link Thomas mentioned before share the link with others it's going to be up there uh, and it's, it's just a wonderful film you know put it on your social media let's uh, let's spread the word and do what you can 
And so we're Dharma Voices for Animals. And Thomas, thank you so much for, yeah. for doing this. Deep, deeply appreciate you. Thank and, you. Uh, congratulations. Um, well, the name of your film, you're working on another film. Uh, did you mention that? Uh, I don't know if I mentioned the name. It's called Compassion in Action, Bringing, okay. bringing the Elixir Home. And it basically follows me and Melody and uh, other people you've seen in the other film and new people uh, as we take the film around and try to spread the message of compassion and interview some people along the way to make us more effective. And so it's a journey and, and it looks like now I may actually do an unabridged cut that's longer that I may release for people who want to take the whole journey with us, but I'm probably going to do a, a 90 minute more focused cut as well. I'm about an hour into the cut right now, so. I think maybe someday Melody will be doing her own uh, film and take you along with. May you get to go to some cool places also. I'll tell you in the new film, we start out at Vegan World 2026 and uh, Silas is talking and you see Melody, she's got, uh, well, there's well, a friend of mine doing camera of Silas. She's next to his tripod with her little uh, pad of some sort video in him <laughs> with her headphones on like she's already doing it so See, we know it you know, maybe she she's goes that next year, you never know <laughs> yeah i know a few people there maybe i can pull some string <laughs> it's great. It's great so um yeah and just to mention those who got on a little bit late with dharma voices for animals dva were the only international buddhist uh, animal rights animal advocacy organization in the world and we'll do maybe we do this again maybe after your next film and this would be great let's kind of plan that whenever that is um so I would like to have you on again. And then awesome. we're going to continue the, the series and we'll offer nutrition. Uh, maybe we get Keegan on here and talk about the film sometime um, and, and all. Thank you all for show, showing up and for spending uh, Saturday, if it's morning or afternoon, or maybe Sunday morning, if you're in Asia, with us. Thomas, again, thanks so much. Deeply appreciate you. And see the film. If, any, if you haven't seen, if you out there haven't seen the film, you got to see the film. It's wonderful. So thanks a lot for being with us. And thank you. I loved it, Bob. Appreciate it. Same. Love you too, good friend. Right, Take peace. care. Take care. Bye.